Alright, so narcolepsy. Starting with DSM-5 criteria for the de for diagnosis. So what is narcolepsy? It's recurrent periods of irresistible need to sleep, lapsing into sleep, or napping occurring within the same day. So irresistible need to sleep, lapsing into sleep, or napping occurring within the same day. These must have been occurring for at, le at least three times per week for the past three months. So again, all of these sleep disorders three times per week for three months, three times per week for three months, at least three times per week for three months. That's the key point you want to remember. So just keep like kind of repping that into your head because that's certainly one of the testable points about the diagnostic criteria. The presence of at least one of the following is for criterion B. So episodes of cataplexy occurring at least a few times per month which is defined as a brief sudden loss of bilateral muscle tone with maintained consciousness. So it's a brief sudden loss of bilateral muscle tone, maintained consciousness, and it's precipitated by laughing or joking in a lot of cases. In children or individuals within six months of onset, um, spontaneous grimacing or jaw opening episodes and tongue thrusting or global hypertonia without without precipitating factors. So in children, it's a little bit different than in adults. It's not just a brief loss of sudden, it's a brief sudden loss of consciousness. In children or individuals within six months of onset, there's spontaneous grimacing. So it, there, there's, there's some other criteria there that you want to kind of familiarize yourself with. But the one that's really testable, I feel like, is the cataplexy and knowing that that's associated with narcolepsy and what that is. Number two, you have a hypocretin deficiency. So hypocretin, also known as orexin, hypocretin deficiency as measured by CSF hypocretin 1, immunoreactivity values less than or equal to one-third of the values obtained from healthy individuals. So that's how you would look at it. You want to see that a person with narcolepsy having less than one-third of the values obtained from healthy individuals. And it cannot be in the context of an acute brain injury or inflammatory or infl inflammation or infection. Uh, three would be nocturnal sleep polysomnography showing rapid eye movement sleep latency less than or equal to 15 minutes or multiple sleep latency tests showing a mean sleep latency of eight minutes and two or more sleep onset REM periods. So again, they basically these patients with narcolepsy enter into REM sleep almost immediately or within a very very short period of time the REM latency is not the typical 90 to 100 minutes that we see in most cases this can occur 15 minutes or if you average it out roughly eight minutes and you could specify narcolepsy without cataplexy but with hypocretin deficiency narcolepsy with cataplexy but without hypocretin deficiency autosomal dominant cerebellar ataxia deafness and narcolepsy autosomal dominant narcolepsy obesity and type 2 diabetes, narcolepsy secondary to another medical condition. So there's a lot of different specifiers in DSM-5. Key things you want to remember is that narcolepsy is this irresistible need to sleep or lapsing into sleep occurring within the same day or multiple napping occurring within the same day and it has to be present at least three times per week for three months. And you want to have one of the following episodes of cataplexy where they have the brief sudden loss of bilateral muscle tone but maintain consciousness and a hypocretin deficiency as measured by CSF hypocretin. Uh, one, immunoreactivity values. So you want to do that to define it. And of course, nocturnal sleep. Uh, you can do the polysomnography or sleep study showing rapid eye movement, sleep latency less than or equal to 15 minutes. So you have to have at least one of the following. I mean, the CSF hypocretin one doesn't sound like a logical test. It's a very invasive test. There's risk for you know, infection, bleeding, damage to surrounding structures if you do a lumbar puncture. So that may not be the best approach for diagnosing narcolepsy. But obviously, episodes of cataplexy make it very easy. And of course, another easier, more easy, less invasive way of testing would be the would be the sleep study. So that would be, I would probably go for either the clinical diagnosis with the periods of cataplexy or look for the sleep study first. And if I wasn't getting it and I still suspected that this person had narcolepsy, then the lumbar puncture for hypocretin. Narcolepsy, it's defined as the following tetrads, sleep paralysis, so sleep paralysis that occurs upon falling asleep or waking up, so a patient can't, feels like they can't move even though they're awake. Sleep attacks with sleep onset, with uh, sleep onset REM periods, so this is usually brief 10 to 15 minute naps that occur at inappropriate times or in inappropriate circumstances. That can be effectively treated uh, with psychostimulants, so that's, or like something like modafinil might be used 
Cataplexy is a condition of sudden and transient bilateral weakness or paralysis. So I said bilateral loss of muscle tone with maintained consciousness. It's usually the classic questions are going to say it's triggered by strong emotion. So triggered by the patient laughing or getting very angry or being surprised. Whatever the case is, they're going to say something along those lines. And then the person loses all muscle tone, maintains consciousness, and falls into like the sleep state. Uh, it frequently lasts only seconds. Hypnagogic or hypnagogic. So hypnagogic is going to sleep, um, uh, hallucinations that occur as you're falling asleep. Um, narcolepsy is rare with an incidence of approximately 0.07%, and the onset is usually in the late teens or early 20s, and is often chronic. So once someone develops it, it's often a chronic course. Genetic factors obviously play a role in 90 to 100% of Asian and Caucasian narcoleptics. Uh, possess the antigen HLA, DR2, and DQWL phenotypes. So you, there is a little bit of a, you know, genetic testing maybe in the future that can be done to, to determine whether or not, you know, narcolepsy is going to be common for that particular patient. And again, it's this HLA, DR2, and DQWL phenotypes. And that's compared with 20 to 40 percent of Asians and Caucasians, non-epileptics, or non-narcoleptics, I'm sorry. In addition, the probability of developing narcolepsy is 40 times greater in uh, if there is an immediate family member who has the disorder. So again, look for an immediate family member who has the disorder, more likely to develop narcolepsy. So when it all comes down to it, once you've diagnosed narcolepsy and you think the patient has it, how do you treat them? Well, like other sleep disorders, sleep hygiene becomes important. And many patients improve with regular sleep cycles, so you want to kind of get them on a regular sleep-wake cycle. You want to have them go to sleep at the same time every night, wake up at the same time every morning. And you want them to get adequate sleep, approximately seven and a half to eight hours per night. The other thing you can do with these patients that may be very helpful would be to schedule naps. You can do scheduled naps as you're going through the process, and that can also help them to, may, to avoid situations that may be dangerous. Pharmacological treatment involves the use of CNS stimulants. I said methylphenidate, modafinil, uh, dextroamphetamine, amphetamine. These may reduce daytime sleepiness and improve symptoms in 65 to 85% of patients. So for a lot of these patients during the day, if they're having excessive daytime sleepiness or they're lapsing into these uh, cataplexy, they're having cataplexy some, at some points throughout the day, this may be a good treatment. So methylphenidate is a stimulant most frequently used for the treatment of narcolepsy. Side effects include headache, irritability, nervousness, and GI complaints. Modafinil. Modafinil is probably the better choice because it's not necessarily as, as um, addictive. So modafinil is a novel weight promoting agent. The mechanism is not understood, <laughs> which is interesting but does involve altering levels of dopamine and nor epi. Unlike the traditional medications, modafinil does not affect the total sleep time or suppress REM sleep. Most common side effects is headache. So remember, modafinil, most common side effect is headache. It's a novel weight promoting agent. Mechanism is still kind of undefined, and it does not involve alternating levels. It does involve alter alternating, altering levels of dopamine and nor epi. Another choice would be sodium oxybate, but this is like rarely used. I've never seen this prescribed personally, but it can be used. It is out there. It is a choice. It's the only treatment for cataplexy that has been approved by the FDA. It can also treat excessive daytime sleepiness. It's a CNS depressant and should not be used with alcohol. So that one, I, I don't know very, very much about seeing that prescribed clinically, but obviously FDA approved it, so it must be good. Those are some of the choices and a little discussion on that. And uh, in the next video, I'm going to move on to the breathing disorders. But for now, I think I'll cut it right there. And that covers most of the details you'll probably need to know for narcolepsy.